So we see that from their time of arrival, we can identify these gamma ray bursts as coming from space. And that meant that uh, these things really didn't need to be classified anymore. And indeed, to stop World War III, in case the Russians uh, got surprised by these things, probably was good to tell people about it. And so these objects were published in uh, an astronomy journal in 1973 uh, and caused a great deal of excitement. Not for us, because we were both in primary school at the time, but you know, astronomers get very excited about a new class of mysterious object. These are pretty weird, these strange flashes of gamma rays of all things coming from out in space. So immediately, lots of smart theorists started coming up with ideas for where these things might come from. Weird and wonderful ideas in vast profusion. One idea, for example, was that these things were coming from fairly nearby, and it might actually be caused by collisions between, say, comets. We know planets don't collide on a regular basis in our solar system, but most of the comets in our solar system are out where we can't see them, in what's called the Oort cloud, a hypothetical shell of comets about half a light year out. And maybe some of the comets they were smashing into one another and, wave one's hands, producing gamma rays somehow. Quite how you produce gamma rays from colliding comets, I'm not sure, because that comets are travelling at about walking pace, but... Well, the good news is when you have no information, you can make up anything you want. So, uh, another idea that came about is that uh, neutron stars, which we knew existed uh, in the form of pulsars, uh, are thought to have sort of a hard outer bit, a crust, uh, and there can be little mountains on those crusts, and if they were to rearrange those crusts, then you might expect that neutron stars through the galaxy would, uh, when they rearrange the crust, might put out uh, a, a bunch of gamma rays as well. Yeah, you'd expect this would be an earthquake on a neutral star, and you'd expect because of the intense gravity that an earthquake would be very violent. It has the right sort of energy. How you get gamma rays out of that? Yeah, who knows? Yes, we'll just wave our hands and look goofy and hope you go away. Um, another possibility is we're looking at the formation of a black hole. We know that a big star dies, runs out of fuel, everything falls down, produces a black hole, and there's plenty of energy there, and maybe some of it comes out as gamma rays somehow. So let's go through. I mean, the big problem is we don't know anything about these objects, right? We don't know how far away they are. So let's go and look at some of the, the energy considerations about these three ideas that emerged when they first came out. So Paul, why don't you, you like comets, why don't you look at comets and see if that uh, comes together? And I like neutron stars and black holes, and so I'll look at those. So could colliding comets actually cause gamma ray bursts? Well, the basic idea is that you have our sun, and you have the planets around it, and then a long, long, long way out, you have a comet cloud called the Oort cloud. It's about 10 to the 16 meters out. It's about a light year out. And most of these comets there are thought to be hundreds of billions of them out there, are little lumps of ice, and they just orbit out there perfectly safely. Every now and then, one of them gets perturbed by a passing star, and zooms in and has a close look at us. And that's when we actually see a comet with all the tail and everything. But the vast majority never come in to see us. They're all orbiting a long way out. So perhaps two of these comets all the way out here could have a head-on collision, and that could produce a gamma ray burst. This would explain why they're seen all over the sky equally in all directions. It wouldn't need to be too luminous because comets are much closer than any of the other possibilities. So can this work? Well, before we get on to that, we have to address some terminology, the issue of fluence. Remember we've measured brightness in flux, which is energy per second per square meter. Now, that's not a very useful unit for dealing with gamma ray bursts, because if you plot the flux against time, it changes like crazy. It goes up, down, up, down, and goes away again all in a few seconds. So you've got a different flux here, zero, very high flux, middle flux, high flux, jumping around all over the place. What we do instead is we just add up all the different fluxes over the entire burst, because it starts at zero, ends at zero, we just add up all the different fluxes, so high flux here, low flux there, add them all together, and that gives us what we call a fluence, which is now, because you've added all of them up, the time has gone away, so it's just energy per square meter. It's the sum of the energy over the entire burst we receive per square meter at Earth. Now these fluences for the bright gamma ray bursts that were discovered first are about 10 to the minus 7 joules per square meter. Can we really produce that sort of gamma ray fluence by colliding comets? Well, let's think about how much energy you've got when two comets collide. 
Now comets are basically snowballs, typical kilometres a radius for about a kilometre. This is a solid bit in the middle, the so-called nucleus of the comet. Their tails are much bigger, but they're insubstantial. They couldn't produce gamma rays. And anyway, when the comets are out here, they're too cold to have tails. When comets are quite close in in our solar system, they're travelling pretty fast, maybe 70 kilometres per second. But when they're out here in the Oort cloud, they're sauntering along to about one metre per second. So let's imagine we have two comets like that, travelling at about one metre per second. How much energy would they generate? Well, first we have to think what the mass of a comet is. Now, the mass is going to be roughly the volume. If we assume they're spherical, of course they're not. They're actually rather funny shaped, but it's going to be ballpark accurate. So that's 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is about a kilometre for a typical comet. So that times the density. Now, if we assume its density is the same as ice on Earth, which is about 1,000 kilograms per cubic metre, in practice, comets are probably less dense than that, but let's use that as an upper limit. That comes out as about 4 by 10 to the 12 kilograms. So pretty heavy. You wouldn't want one landing on your foot. And let's say now two of these things collide. Their energy, kinetic energy, is going to be half mv squared each. And there are two of them, so that means it's going to be mv squared. V is about one meter per second, so that means the total kinetic energy is just the uh, mass of a typical comet times one squared, which is one. So that's about four by ten to the twelve joules. So that's the energy. What's the fluence we'd receive on Earth? Well, the fluence, if you remember, is just adding up all the fluxes. We know that fluxes obey the inverse square, law, inverse square law, so it's equal to the luminosity divided by 4 pi d squared. So as fluence is just adding up fluxes, it must obey the same thing. So the fluence is just the adding up all the, the um, luminosities, which is going to be the total energy generated, which we've just calculated up here, divided by 4 pi d squared. And d is about 10 to the 16 meters. So if you factor that all in, that comes out as about 3 by 10 to the minus 21 joules per meter squared. Very small. Now, if you remember, the observed value was about 10 to the minus 7. So we are too faint, not really a little bit too faint. We are about 10 to the 14, that's 100 trillion times too faint. Could we get around that? Hmm. Well, we could make the comets bigger. If we make them t 100 times bigger, that would give us 100 squared times more mass. Um, that'll take four orders of magnitude add to this. So it goes to 10 to the minus 17. Still far too small. How about if we make them closer? If we make them uh, or go faster? Even if we make all those things happen, it's 10 to the 14 is an awfully big gap. There's no way we're going to make that up. And we've been assuming that when you collide two big lumps of ice, all the energy comes out as gamma rays. It doesn't. I mean, I've never thrown two snowballs together myself and seen gamma rays come out. You just get a bit of a smash and a slightly larger snowball. So even if all the energy could be liberated, it isn't enough. And it's extremely unlikely the energy would come out in gamma rays. So really not plausible.